Okay, everyone, let's, um, let's make a start to this. So welcome to the Waze Workshop, second week, second day. Um, and thanks all, to all of you for, for being here. This is session 10 about snow, fern, and surface mass balance. Um, and we have six wonderful speakers coming up in the next um, hour and a half before um, really f ending this session with a discussion. So um, the presenters have around plus or minus 10 minutes for presentation. I know that Matt has said eight, but we're going slightly over it. Uh, let's, let's hope we everyone can stay within those 10 minutes. Um, I will give you, and Sammy will give you in the second half, a two minute left warning on the chat and a vocal warning when the time is up. Um, please mute yourselves if you're not presenting. Um, also know that uh, for the presenters especially that this um, session will be recorded and shared on YouTube later on. Um, and I think these were my main um, announcements. So I think we can get started with presenter one, which is Scott Braddock. And Scott will talk about recent relative sea level history for the Pine Island Bay in West Antarctica. Scott, the, the, the floor is yours. So please share your screen and you can get started. Thank you. Are we looking good? Yes, go all ahead. Right. All right, well, thank you all for having me today. I think I'm a bit of an oddball in this group and that I'm gonna be talking about Holocene recent history of um, in this Pine Island Bay region. But yeah, today I'm gonna to discuss our research efforts um, in developing a relative sea level curve for the Pine Island Bay region that consists of about 70 radiocarbon dates of marine organic material. Um, this project is part of the larger uh, International Kuwait's Glacier Collaboration, um, which of course was created because of the significant significant ice mass loss that's going on today. Um, and I mean, this question dates back, or this idea that Thwaites and Pine Island might be a weak point for the Western Arctic ice sheet to the 70s with George Denton and Terence Hughes here at the University of Maine. Um, so this is this continuation of that work decades later um, that I'm excited to be part of. Our project um, like I said, it's part of the greater ITGC for the geologic history constraints. You might have seen Brent give a chat, um, I think it was last week, on a part of this overall project. Um, and I'll go over that in a bit. But this work is important to understand what was happening during the Holocene, um, to get that data in the forward projected models, and to put into better context what exactly is going on today and if it's actually happened recently as well. I'll start by getting into some of the terrestrial evidence, and this is pretty limited because there's not much ice-free land um, in the area. Um, but on the right-hand side here, you can see a, a little map, and it shows where some of these data are coming from, Mount Murphy, as well as Mount Moses. So these are exposed noon attacks or volcanic peaks that are sticking out of the snow, um, where researchers were able to go and collect samples from erratics so or bedrock for cosmogenic exposure age dating. Um, these three figures on the left, A, B, and C, they're all plotting altitude and meters against exposure age and years. So all the colored circles in there, those are the data points that come from the erratics and bedrocks. And the important thing here is the dashed lines in each of these figures uh, that my cursor is around here. These each represent um, the ice elevation today. And there are a number in here, the colors correlate with data points. That's the current ice elevation. And what these data show is that the age from all these exposure age dates around the mid Holocene, so four or five, 6,000 years before present, right at the current ice extent, or the ice elevation rather. And this sets up two possible scenarios for what's happened since the mid Holocene. So either nothing's happened, the ice has been relatively stable, the thickness at least, um, and it didn't change in the last 5,000 years, or alternatively, glaciers thin. Uh, we would presume this is accompanied by grounding line retreat because these sites are pretty close to the current grounding line, of the weights in Pine Island today. And then those glaciers were able to re-advance. And this second scenario, if true, is important to go into some of these models today because it would show that these glaciers have retreated to smaller than present and been able to recover, um, which gets at that question of whether or not they're already experiencing a, a runaway retreat. So these are the two scenarios that we're testing for. And we have a 
number of teams going out to tackle this in a few different approaches. Um, in the red boxes here at Mount Murphy and Hudson Mountains, this is in the left figure, um, showing kind of the Pine Island Amundsen Sea sector as a whole. We have teams that will drill into the ice and collect bedrock samples beneath the ice. And they can use isotope chemistry on those bedrock samples to definitively say if they've been exposed to cosmogenic uh, nuclides during the Holocene. So that'll say if ice was below that point, had been to below that, uh, where they drilled to, which I think is about 30 meters down. And then to accompany this work and complement it, myself and another grad student at UMaine, we went out and were able to visit a number of islands in the Pine Island Bay region. That's in the green box on the left figure here. So these little tiny islands up here are the Lindsay, Edwards, and Schaefer's Islands. Those are blown up over here. This is some of the actual imagery we had on the ship to be able to scout out and see where we could land zodiacs on the islands. And our goal was to collect marine organic material from raised marine deposits um, to construct that relative sea level curve. And there are, I'll call it the RSL curve from here on out, but the RSL curves are important because they're going to give you a minimum age for deglaciation. So when these, when this area was ice free from grounded ice, but also the shape of the curve that we get, is going to give us information in the ice history. So for example, a certain shape of the curve can suggest gradual ice retreat um, throughout the Holocene, as opposed to another shape of the curve might imply some sort of retreat and re-advance event. So this is what we're looking for in understanding what happened during the Holocene. All right, to get everyone oriented with um, what the field work looked like, this top figure here, this is one of the islands, this is Lindsay Island One, we called it. Um, and in this photo, you can see a number of crescent shaped ridges. I'm trying to highlight them here with my mouse. Those are raised marine beaches from the, up from the highest elevation. It's kind of like a staircase right down to sea level. And on each of these beaches, we'll record the elevation with high precision GPS. And then we'll actually dig into the beaches, usually about half a meter before we hit frozen earth. And we're looking for any marine organic material that we can use for radiocarbon dating. Um, and these, the center panel here is a shell. This is, uh, we found plenty of those. And those are important because the shells give us a maximum or actual age for the beach. So if the shell is broken apart as the beach forms, maybe during a storm event that'll date the actual formation of that beach, uh, maybe, or possibly the shower is reworked uh, into the beach and that will give us a maximum age. Whereas the bones, which came almost uh, all from the Delhi penguins, those are found near the surface. Those are gonna give us a minimum age. Um, so after that beach had formed, penguins set up their rookeries there and die and deposit those bones. So we'll have bracketing ages um, from shells and bones and we'll have the actual elevation of the beach. And then from that, we process all the samples in house here at UMaine um, and send them out for radiocarbon dating. Um, and I'll jump right in now to um, our results. So here is the, the preliminary Pine Island Bay relative sea level curve. Um, I say preliminary because there's still a number of dates that we're gonna get to fill this in. Um, and what we have is elevation on the y-axis plotted against calendar years before present. So all those radiocarbon dates were converted to calendar years. Um, just to reiterate from the last slide, the orange data points here represent minimum ages from bones. And then the blue upward facing triangles, those are either actual or maximum ages from the shells. Um, there's this black trend line drawn through the maximum age data points. So that's there more for a visual representation. Um, I expect that to change slightly as we get more data points in, possibly it'll steepen or, or, uh, or lessen. And that's a solid black line up until about 13 meters above that. We don't have any constraining um, maximum ages, so then we just turn it to a dash line. And again, that slope may change. Uh, unfortunately, we had no shells above that 13 meter elevation on any of the islands. All right, so tying this back into the, those two scenarios and kind of the bigger umbrella question that we had um, and what conclusions we can draw from this. We have a minimum age for retreat of grounded ice around 10.7 thousand years before present. So that value isn't in this uh, curve, but it is a, a shell fragment that we found in a modern beach that must have been reworked, but it gives a minimum age for when ice must have retreated. And that agrees well with offshore marine records too. So, um, so we're really lucky that we found that shell. Um, but the actual shape of the curve and the data suggests a continuous and uninterrupted rebound um, with this unloading likely before 5,000 years before present. And we say that based on the the steepness of the curve or rather the shallowness of it. Um, 
in these average relative seal of change that we see over the entire record, which is around four millimeters a year. If we compare this to current uplift rates, um, which are around 15 to 40 millimeters a year from our sample site to around the grounding line, that's an order of magnitude different. And that likely reflects the elastic rebound uh, going on today from rapid retreat of ice. Um, but I should also take or mention that RSL takes into account more than just uplift. There's also global sea levels change and glacial isostatic adjustments that are factored into these rates. Um, but this overall ties into that, that question of which scenario is more likely during the Holocene and suggests that maybe ice um, hadn't changed much, that there wasn't a big retreat and re-advance event, but at, that the ice had remained relatively constant during that time. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how this compares with the, the ice core um, team, or rather the team that's going beneath the ice to get the rock cores um, in the coming years. And hopefully we'll have some more updated information to present at AGU as well uh, um, in December. So I'll leave it with that. Um, these are all the PIs on the project. It's a pretty large team. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, are there any questions? People can speak up or and or um, pose their questions in the chat. That's all possible. So please go ahead if you have a question. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, I see one. So yeah, if you if you want to read up the questions, Scott, that's. Please go ahead. If not, I can do it too. Terry asked if exposure age dating is being done as well. And yes, it is. So one of the figures I showed was from Joe Johnson. She published a paper recently. Um, I know her and her team were out there last year and collected a bunch of uh, samples from, let me see if I can go back real quick here, from this Hudson Mountain area um, that they're going to be um, showing the results for soon uh, for cosmogenic exposure age dating. And then they already have a bunch of the Mount Murphy area as well. Any more questions before we move on to the next speaker? No? Okay. Uh, if you still have questions for Scott, please um, pose them in the chat and he can respond in the chat as well or uh, take personal contact, of course. Um, so let's move on to our second speaker. Um, let me find my list here. Okay, there we go. Um, with his, which is Sammy, <laughs> sorry, Sammy. <laughs> um, so Sammy Buzzard is going to talk about uh, a three-dimensional model of Antarctic ice shelf surface hydrology. So Sammy, if you can start sharing your screen, we can hopefully see yes. what's going on. Okay, and apologize if anything weird happens here, my internet decided to like just freeze up as Jan was introducing me. So. Let's hope we make it through this. Um, eight minutes of presentation, plus or minus. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about a 3D model of Antarctic ice shelf surface hydrology that I've been developing while I've been working at Georgia Tech with Alex Rabel. Um, so we've not actually seen this image a ton of times at WACE already. I don't know if it's because a lot of the kind of basal stuff's happened already. Um, but yeah, I don't feel too bad about showing you a satellite image of Larsen B, even though we normally see this one a ton of times at any conference. So this is the Larsen B ice shelf just before it collapsed. And then of course in 2002, as we likely most of us know, it suffered um, sudden and dramatic collapse right across the ice shelf. An area of road, um, ice about the size of Rhode Island was lost in less than a month. And we think that a significant um, factor in this sudden collapse is the fact that Larsen B was experiencing quite so much surface melting just before the collapse happened. So there were lakes all over the ice shelf surface and these were noted to drain a kind of chain reaction just before that sudden collapse. So it's sort of they were pretty key in that occurring. Um, so why do we care about ice shelf collapses? Um, well, ice shelves, obviously ice flows off of the land on Antarctica and onto the ice shelves which are floating on the ocean. So they don't directly contribute to sea level rise, but they do, of course, provide resistive stresses that buttress all of that ice that's still on the land. So preventing that accelerating and going into the ocean and contributing to sea level rise. Um, and of course, the sea level contribution from Antarctica 
has been observed to have been increasing um, and the rate at which is increasing is accelerating over the past few decades. But in order to really understand how that is going to increase in the future, we need to understand what's going to happen to Antarctica's ice shelves and how stable they're going to remain, which ones are potentially in danger of sudden collapse. And in order to understand that, we need to know more about the surface hydrology on top of the ice shelves. Where is that water going and what problems might it be causing for those ice shelves? OK, so I'm just going to introduce some previous work quickly because the current stuff I'm doing built on that. So this is the Larsen Sea ice shelf, um, which I studied for most of my PhD time. And if we just zoom into the top near the grounding line there, we can see that there is significant melt that has been observed to occur on the Larsen Sea ice shelf. So most of my PhD was spent trying to model this surface melt and try and work out exactly how these lakes were forming because Larsen Sea has a very thick fern layer compared to some other ice shelves. So I'm actually a mathematician by training, so that's enough satisfied images. We're just gonna look at an idealized ice shelf now. So of course we have ice, then snow and fern on top of that. And then between, somewhere between that, there's the pore closure depth, um, which is where any water that um, is produced at the surface of the ice shelf can't get any lower than that so it's a point where the snow and fern hasn't quite become ice but it's impermeable to any water so the part of the ice shelf that I really care about in terms of this modelling study is just the top few metres um, up last and see it could be as deep as kind of 20 or 30 metres before you get to the pore closure depth but definitely just a small proportion of the ice shelf here. Um, so there are three possible ways that we thought that melt lakes could be forming on top of Larsen Sea. So here we have the ice, the pore closure depth, and then above that the snow. I'm hoping you can see my cursor and I'm not just kind of waving it randomly. Good, I see someone nodding, great. Um, so the most simple um, version of this is that we see melting at the top of the ice shelf. It will percolate down into the snow and fern. Eventually, some of it will freeze on the way, but eventually it will reach the pore closure depth and it will saturate the ice shelf from the pore closure depth upwards until the water's got nowhere left to go and it will just sit on top of the surface and form a lake. Now, in somewhere like Larsen Sea, this seems like a pretty unlikely scenario because, as I said, the pore closure depth might be 30 metres down. So that's going to be a lot of water you need to saturate all of that then. Now, ice shelves, of course, aren't completely flat. So a more realistic scenario is that we have some melting in one area, but if that melting occurs in a topographical low, then we're also going to get lateral transport of melt water coming into that area too. And that might be enough to completely saturate the fern. And the third possible scenario and the one that I was most interested in investigating was well, what happens if enough water refreezes within the fern that actually the remaining water can never get to the pore closure depth. So we get the formation of ice lenses that are then impermeable to any further melt water and any more melting will just sit on top of those, meaning that actually much less of the fern needs to be saturated to form a lake. Okay, so I developed a one-dimensional model to try and um, investigate this question. So if you want to find out more, it is in these papers here and the code is all open access and people are using it, which is really exciting. But if you do want to use it, then Talk to me first because I might have something better for you, as I'll hopefully tell you in a minute or two. Um, but just to quickly go over the model, it has a surface energy balance that so works out how much melting is happening at the top of the ice shelf. It works out where that heat goes in the, into the ice shelf and where that water goes into the ice shelf. And it accounts for the formation of ice lenses and ultimately lakes on top of the ice shelf. And it can do that over several years, which is one of the things that made it new and exciting is that it could do the whole life like the whole lake life cycle over multiple years and look at how those lakes affected those ice shelves when they kept occurring. Um, and one thing that we did notice, and your faces are all over my plot here for me, so I'm just going to move it all over. Um, one thing that we did notice is this is the density profile of the ice shelf. So here we've got on the y-axis zeros, the top negative numbers are looking down into the ice shelf then density across the x-axis. If we zoom into the bottom here, we can see these kind of spiky features that occurred in the density profile. And this was evidence of these ice lenses forming. So that was one of the kind of key things that we found on Larsen C is that actually the full fern layer wasn't getting saturated for these lakes to form. Um, and luckily, because this was a modelling study, there was actually some field work that occurred independently of this at the same time so that we could actually test these results that the model came up with and this here is from the Midas project so that's the University of Swansea and Aberystwyth in Wales 
Um, so they dug this snow pit into um, one of the high melt areas in Larson Sea. They dug another one behind it that was identical and um, they then shone a light through that kind of wall of snow and ice and that showed very clearly that these ice lenses were forming in a way that very much matched what the model was showing. Um, so that was pretty exciting that the modeling matched the observations. Um, but of course, a 1D model isn't actually going to cut it for most ice shelves. Um, so this is a video you may well have seen before of Nansen ice shelves. So not only are there fast flowing rivers on this ice shelf, but there are also waterfalls and that we definitely can't model using a one dimensional model. So entomonics, which is the model of Antarctic ice shelf surface hydrology and stability. Every time I look at this acronym, I think it's even worse, but never mind. Um, every time I see a monarch butterfly, it just gives me work-related stress now, <laughs> so maybe I'll have to change it. But monarchs is, takes this 1D vertical column model and scales it up so that it can be used in three dimension, dimensions. So it's forced by automatic weather station data where it's available, or if not, it could be climate model data. It goes through all those processes that the 1D model has, but then it allows those 1D vertical columns to interact with each other, which allows us to move water around laterally on the ice shelf surface which means that we can model processes such, the form, such as the formation of those rivers and look at how, where water is going to end up over the whole ice shelf based on topography and other processes. Um, other things that we're hoping to build into that are things like ice shelf flexure and, um, as a result of the loading of the water onto the ice shelf and the erosion of those river channels through that fast flowing water. So monarchs will enable us to provide a surface melt distribution for any ice shelf, either currently if data is available, or to look at how those ice shelves might change in the future if we're using climate model data to force it. And ultimately it's going to be scaled up and I'm happy that we have had this funded under NASA map to be able to put it into ISSM and see what happens and hopefully some even bigger Earth system models as well there. Um, so just to show you a few examples of proof of concept. So this um, you can see here on your left is the height, um, a DEM of Pineyan Glacier, as the GIF on the blue GIF is showing you the water depth. Um, so we start with a random distribution and that's just essentially seeing where the water will end up falling on the ice shelf just based on topography. So this doesn't include the heat component at the moment, that's something I'm trying to currently couple up with the surface water algorithm. Hopefully it's always there, but this shows you what happens just with the surface water routing algorithm and you can see that the water does very much pull into topographical lows on the ice shelf. Now one event that I really wanted to try and test this with was the George VI ice shelf because um, that was noted earlier this year to have really significant melting to be going on so this is Sentinel-2 imagery you can see here of that melt event and my attempt to reproduce that using monarchs. Um, so you can see here that in red this sort of horseshoe shaped feature actually is captured pretty well by monarchs. Um, the yellow feature there, which is actually in real life a lake, has kind of become more of a river feature in monarchs. That for me was justification, not only for being really careful about what DEM I'm using, um, because it shows the topography really matters, but also maybe for including some of those extra physical processes I want to put into the model, um, if this isn't just related to topography. Um, finally, just because I had a really nice DEM for this ice shelf, um, this was, um, thank you to Sophie Berger for that, but this is a similar thing for Roy Bedouin ice shelf, um, just because that makes some really nice kind of channel features when you put some a random water distribution onto the surface. Okay, um, and I've ended every talk I've given for at least the past year with this slide, but these questions still absolutely apply. Um, if there are processes that you think should be included in Tomonics, then please let me know. Um, either it's something I might be excited about putting in myself, or if you think it would be useful when the model is um, published and out there, it will be open access. So I'm also more than happy to help you putting new processes into it, if that's something you'd be interested to do. And also, if you have data that you think we could use to calibrate or validate Monics, um, I'm trying to do a ton of different case studies. Um, and looking at new features is always exciting, so please do get in touch. Um, so that, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Sammy. Are there questions? Either in the chat or you can speak up, especially students, please. 
come up with those questions, that means here. I'm just going to come out of screen share because I can't see the chat otherwise. So uh, teacher Young is asking Sammy um, how you can incorporate dynamic changes in elevation to your model. For example, I shall flexure. If um, yeah. Yeah, so this is something I'm very much hoping to do. So Ali Ban was obviously done a lot of work in that area. So hopefully in collaboration with her, we can think more about that. Um, in the future, but the surface height can be changed to match how we think that is changing um, in relation to the water loading. So yeah, that's probably not a very helpful answer to the question I'm trying to think. And exactly how I can say that in some more detail. You, you can always respond in the chat later too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Are there more questions for Sammy? Yeah. Maybe a follow up question if there's kind of is the topography, I guess, I mean, I guess you trying to answer my question is, is the topography dynamic in the sense that based on the amount of melt that it's actually changing the fern thickness at the same time? I um, couldn't quite hear that. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, Wait, your, 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 your quality is a little bit uh, inferior, but uh, I, I think I understood your question in the sense that uh, if there is melt going on on the ice shelf in your model, does that also change the fern air thickness? Was that your question, Brooke? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, free, like feel free to, to put it in the chat. Um, I'll, she will type it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Um, Sammy, I have a question. How, how it's probably a, a pretty technical one, but how do you initialize your model? For example, for, you know, for these case studies that you showed, is this a homogeneous fern layer or how do you spin up your fern layer, you know, for decades before you, uh, really look at the case study? Um, yeah, so I do spin up the fern layer. It, we generally found, especially in the 1D studies, that actually the initial fern conditions didn't make a lot of difference once you've really started melting. Because um, obviously it just gets so dense so quickly once you start refreezing water within the fern. Um, but yeah, we do allow it to spin up first. So it is homogeneous because they just aren't the observations of burn to really do otherwise at the moment. Okay, Brooke's question is, uh, as you can read in the chat, Sammy, does the model change, I guess, freeboard as meltwater moves? <laughs> it does not at the moment, but that is, um, yeah, so that is a follow up to TJ's question. That's something I will have to consider when I start looking at lecture. So at the moment, we just care really about the top kind of few tens of meters, um, but I will need to think about rebuild more in the future. That is, yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks very much, Sammy. Um, so let's move on to Riley. So Riley, if you're ready, please share your screen. Riley Kilberg is going to talk about quantifying uncertainty in a 16 year time series of Larsen sea ice shell thickness from airborne radar sounding. Yes, thanks. All right, yeah, so this is some work that's kind of the original brainchild of Matt Sigrid and that working on with Brooke Medley and my advisor, Dusty Schroeder, as well. And as you can probably tell from the title, this is really sort of a radar nerds project wrapped in an ice shelf project being presented in an SMB session. So we will skip over a lot of things, and what I'll mostly talk about is basically how fern processes are making this hard. Um, but before we get to that, it's probably worth mentioning for a moment why we would bother with radar sounding when we've already got folks making these fantastic maps of basal melt rates across the continent with satellite altimetry. Um, I guess the short answer to that um, is that the nice thing about radar sounding is we resolve both the surface interface and the ice ocean interface. Um, so we're not reliant on this assumption of hydrostatic equilibrium to get after ice shelf thickness, and we can actually make something closer to a direct measurement of that. Um, so one of the science goals from Operation Icebridge has been to try and make these ice shelf thickness measurements um, with the radar sounders they were flying. 
Uh, but up to this point, no one's really gone back to look at that data record now that it's over and see how well we were able to do with that. Um, but that's what we're going to try to do in this project. And it turns out that Larson C is a nice place to look at this because you can see on the right, we've got a bunch of these repeat flight lines um, from between about 2002 to 2018, um, which gives us pretty good coverage and like understanding of how kind of all of the systems that University of Kansas like has flown in Antarctica has sort of behaved in this context. So jumping into it, um, if we lived in a sort of ideal theorist world in which ice shells truly were sort of flat slabs of meteoric ice, this would be a super easy problem. We just need to measure two-way travel time to the um, surface, two-way travel time to the bed, account for that change in wave velocity inside of the ice shelf, you get your thickness. Um, and in this magical ideal world, really the only thing that's actually constraining how precisely we can do this is the thermal noise of our instrument. So we're talking about probably being able to get a sort of centimeter scale precision. Now, of course, you pull up the OIB data and it becomes imminently clear that we are not living in an ideal world. Um, in fact, there's upfront just a bunch of sort of radar issues that we have to think about, whether that sort of side lobes or the fact that the surface multiple tends to overlap the bed return all the time, um, or these weird splicing lines where we're sticking images from two different pulse links together. But the piece that I'll mostly talk about for the rest of this talk is sort of all of the hidden issues, I guess, of um, environmental conditions that are like in the background of this data. So we can imagine that our like realistic ice shelf maybe looks something more like this with this whole menu of like basal conditions and sort of in glacial conditions and near surface conditions that are all contributing to making these measurements hard. And I mostly won't talk about the basal stuff. That's usually issues of sort of rough surface scattering and really high attenuation and accreted marine ice that have been pretty well touched on in the literature before. Um, I will take a moment to talk about sort of issues of variable density in the fern and really anything that potentially introduces liquid water into the inglacial system, because all of that's really going to mess with our ability to accurately convert um, from two-way travel times into an actual thickness for the ice shelf. Um, and I guess I'll you know say for these that my personal boogeyman is probably on the liquid water um, issue because that can pretty easily get you sort of errors or uncertainties that are on the order of maybe sort of like five to ten meters. Um, and this is probably the thing that we know the least well, particularly when you're talking about like, oh, on the day that Icebridge flew this at like 10 a.m., was the fern wet or not? Um, so for the modelers out there, anyone who can like work on that in a great, you know, 3D sense, that's awesome and will be super helpful to these kind of problems. Um, the other like super interesting thing with this is that typically we think of the surface return as being like very nice, like, oh, we're just sampling this like, ice air interface, great, should be smooth, should be well behaved. But the reality is, especially for a lot of these older radar systems, they have kind of crappy range resolution, like maybe 16 meters or something. And so that surface return that we're looking at is actually incorporating the surface and about 16 meters of whatever the heck is going on in the fern, like into that single measurement, all sort of integrated together. Um, and so you might be getting a surface measurement that's actually including a ton of sort of heterogeneous ice lenses or sort of massive ice slabs in it as well, or part of your fern aquifer or something weird like that. Um, so this is particularly an issue for us on Larsen C because we know from some of the higher resolution radar measurements that we tend to get these really bright subsurface layers um, that seem to be indicative of like refrozen melt of the previous summer surface. Um, and so one of the things that we want to look at here is what kind of errors is that likely to induce and like where we measure the surface to be relative to where it should actually be. Um, and so it's kind of what we're looking at in this plot on the left. So the dark blue line at zero is where our sort of true surface elevation is located. And then the slanted line in orange is where the depth at which we've added some additional bright subsurface sort of melt layer, ice layer. Um, and then what you're looking at in yellow, purple, and green are all curves of where we from our radar data would think the surface was located. Um, if we were measuring it just with the system and didn't really know anything about the presence of the subsurface layer. And so the thing to note here is basically like the deeper that layer is and the brighter it is relative to the surface, the more it's going to screw up your measurements. Um, and that also you can get sort of because of phase interference between these two um, surfaces, these really rapid jumps in the surface elevation that are, you know, essentially spurious. Um, but it means that really sort of centimeter scale changes in how your surface is spaced with your subsurface ice layers can cause you to think that you've suddenly like jumped up 10 meters in your surface elevation if you're not expecting this to be a thing. Um, so the other issue with this um, is that if you don't know anything about sort of what this subsurface trajectory looks like and you just have to make an assumption that it's there um, 
and behaving in some way, is that you inevitably come to the conclusion that you're going to have some sort of rather significant bias that sort of makes your yourself look thinner than it ought to be. Um, and you can see that in the histograms on the right. Um, this basically scales with range resolution. So for 2009, where we had this not so great 16 meter range resolution, um, you know, we have a sort of median bias that you'd predict is something on the order of five meters compared to about 46 centimeters in 2016, where we had much better range resolution. Um, and the fun thing is that we can totally see a lot of this in the data. Um, so here, what I'm doing is comparing in red the um, laser altimeter measurements of the surface elevation with the radar drive surface elevations in blue. This is in 2009 on the top, 2016 in the bottom. Um, and so what you clearly see in 2009 is we're getting these really large sort of 10 to 15 meter jumps in the surface elevation kind of at the range resolution of the radar, really only resolving the trends in the surface elevation kind of this tens of kilometer scale. On the other hand, in 2016, where we had much better resolution with our radar, um, we're actually doing quite fantastically at tracking the laser altimeter measurements um, of errors that are sort of maybe on the order of half meter or so in the worst case scenario. Um, so I think this is very interesting and like useful because if we want to be able to make some attempt at sort of correcting for these effects in the data that we have right now, we're really reliant on these sort of broad assumptions of like, oh, maybe there is a layer there, but we don't really know how bright it is or how deep it is or like how that behavior is sort of scaling spatially across our ice shelf. Um, and yeah, so for the folks collecting data or the folks doing models out there, um, any kind of sort of real like 3D understanding of the subsurface fern structure, especially when we're going back to some of these older data records and trying to use them can be really, really useful in trying to correct or at least understand the scale of errors that we have in that data and what kind of uncertainty to expect. So I guess getting back to our overall question of, well, how well did we do with IceBridge? Um, if you roll in all of these for uncertainties and some you know, other stuff that I didn't talk about too much, um, this is kind of what we're looking at for distributions of error that you would expect um, across the ice shelf uh, for Larson C. And you see kind of what you'd expect that sort of back in the early 2000s with these um, radars that had sort of less good range resolution, uh, median errors, not so great, it's on the order of 14 meters, but getting up into sort of the more modern era of radars, like 2016 to 2018, um, errors of maybe only, median errors of maybe only like five meters and changes in ice shelf thickness. Um, but you also have these very long tails on all of these, which I think points to the fact that like, we can do a lot with improving the radar systems, but just the conditions on the ice shelf itself in a lot of ways govern what uncertainty we will have in many of these places. And that's something that we can't really do a lot about besides trying to understand those conditions better and the impact that they're having on our measurements. Um, but it does seem that at least um, on Larson C in an Eulerian frame of reference, um, this is enough over sort of five year time periods to at least um, resolve some trends in changes in ice shelf thickness. So you're looking here, in blue, it changes between 2004 and 2009 uh, when the shelf was thinning. And then again in red between 2010 and 2016 when it was thickening. Um, and so it's nice to see one that we're resolving these and that these do seem to match the trends from um, satellite altimetry. We again showed this thinning up through about 2009 and then thickening again towards um, 2015 or so. Um, yeah, so thanks for listening to this. And I guess I will just finish with my uh, closing soapbox that I at least really want better measurements and better models of sort of 3D subsurface fern structure, not just because it's telling us things about the surface mass balance, but also because it turns out that all of that structure is totally messing with the ways that we try and measure the mass balance. Um, so really interested to see what the community will have like on both of those fronts in the future. Thanks. Thanks very much, Riley. Super interesting. Um, Riley, can you see this chat or should I read the, the question? Um, I think if I stop sharing, then I can see the chat. Yeah, okay. Cool. Um, okay, yeah, so Torsten was asking what radar we're using. Um, it doesn't make sense to use different radars on IceBridge and combine them. Um, yeah, so this is all M chords um, from the IceBridge era or previous versions of M chords. I guess, only, guess we technically started with, we have I chords, A chords, and three versions of M chords in this analysis. So kind of the whole history of that. Um, yeah, I think especially with the surface stuff, there's a temptation to like use the coincident accumulation radar as well um, where that exists. Um, but there's a, one of the problems that we ran into, I think, with trying to combine sort of different radar systems, particularly for like bed and surface measurements, is you now need to be very accurate in sort of like the, in the, you can't just take relative measurements. You need, you know, absolute measurements of surface elevation if you're going to do that. And there are some 
other issues with that, for example, MCORD seems to, for some reason, have a kind of arbitrary-ish 10 meter bias in absolute surface elevation between the laser measurements that I don't know where it's coming from um, and other fun things like that. So there are a lot of sort of like radar centric issues that you get out of by using these relative measurements between surface and bed and not going to two different systems. But that is definitely one way you can approach the problem is to try to go to sort of ancillary um, data or other ways of like combining different pieces to get it the, the same stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions for Riley? No? Oh, sorry. Uh, Brooke has a question. Uh, will you do a similar analysis with accumulation? Um, so I guess when we get enough data from the new version of accumulation that tends to see the bottom of things, yeah, that would be awesome um, to do. I guess we don't right now have a ton of that data, uh, but maybe some of the stuff, I guess, coming out of the Thwaites uh, collaboration in particular, like might actually have that for the ice shelves. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Riley. Um, great talk. Let's. Um, Take a break for nine minutes and come back uh, at um, four fifty Eastern. So that's in nine minutes, eight minutes from now, uh, and then we can uh, continue with the other three talks and our discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, make that five fifty. So we should probably get going again. Um, so. Starting us off for the second half of the session, we've got Marissa Dapper. So, um, Marissa, if you want to take it away. Um, and I actually, I should say, I realized while I was doing my presentation, while Jan was convening, I couldn't see the chat. So when you've got two minutes to go, I'll just try and wave at you. Um, and then I'll like give you a vocal warning if you get down to one minute to go. So hopefully you can see that. Yeah, Marissa, take it away. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about the Larson C surface properties um, and kind of getting at them from a radio transfer modeling perspective. All right, and I work with Brooke um, as a PhD student at UC Maryland. All right, so I'm going to start out with microwave radiation, uh, observations of microwave right radiation, and from that, um, calculating melt, calculating liquid water. Um, right, and so the first place that we start out with is we start out at the community fern model. We model snow profiles, so we take um, temperature, density, and grain size information starting out at the surface and going down to um, focus on the first 10 meters in depth um, for a certain place in time for the Larson C. And I'll kind of work through this flow chart of how we go about this from start to finish. Right? So we have this one snow profile, right? Um, and I didn't mention any liquid water associated with that. Um, so what we're actually doing is we're going to try to come up with this an independent product of liquid water, right? So to do that, we iterate through. So we start out with, okay, assume there's no melt, you assume there's no liquid water at all. And then maybe assume there's a little bit more and then a little bit more, kind of a, an iterative sense, right? And so for each of those different scenarios, we plug this into a snow microwave radi radiative transfer model, which models the emission and scattering from that snow and fern. And the reason why we do this is because wet snow will emit more radiation than dry snow will. So we kind of exploit that relationship, right? So we can come up with these model brightness temperatures from our emission in scattering model. And so uh, lower brightness temperatures are, are associated with less melt and higher brightness temperatures are associated with more melt generally, right? So when we compare this to an observed brightness temperature, so say we have a radiometer that's facing this column of snow and fern. And it senses that it's 231 Kelvin, right? So that makes us go along and say, okay, what's the closest model brightness temperature? 230 Kelvin, and that can kind of go back and show us, okay, maybe there's five millimeters of water equivalent in integrated whatever, over whatever kind of depth region that's appropriate for the frequency of um, the microwave channel that we're using, right? So. Our observed brightness temperatures come from AMSR2, uh, which is a passive microwave radiometer. So it observes the microwave emission and scattering integrated over the Earth's atmosphere um, and surface. But the specific wavelengths that we're using focus on um, from the, uh, uh, the surface to uh, 15 meters of snow and fern. 
Okay, so we kind of started out with, okay, a modeled snow profile, and then we iterate um, through different amounts of liquid water uh, to model brightness temperatures, and then we go back and see, okay, what's the observed brightness temperature to back out what uh, the amount of liquid water there could be, right? But if we start out with uh, modeled snow profiles that are inaccurate, then we're not going to be able to do this, and so that's kind of, you know, one of the previous problems at, you know, being able to do this or before um, would be that we don't have um, fern modeling, you know, good enough to get these snow profiles. But actually, as years have progressed, fern models, especially temperature data within fern modeling, has improved. Um, so we are set there um, to to a degree. But one uncertain key factor still is grain size. Um, so grain size um, is difficult to sort of um, at this point constrain over polar fern over ice sheets. So the community fern model actually sticks with a constant initial grain size of about 0.1 millimeters. But if we go over and we look at data from Mosaic of Antarctica um, and for the Larsen Sea, grain size um, in some areas can be as much as um, four to five times that of the initial grain size in the community fern model. So especially when we're focusing on um, such um, pretty close to the surface, right? The first, you know, say five meters, this would really bias our, our grain size to be too small. So that's definitely something to consider, especially because grain size does have an influence on um, the overall brightness temperature throughout the year. So that being said, sort of my preliminary idea, preliminary figures so far um, are as follows. So this is over the course of a year for um, a specific example on the Larsen C. So the black line represents the observations of brightness temperature. Um, and as notable, you know, in the austral summer, we have a lot of these, you know, peaks um, and it kind of over the austral winter, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty much um, constant, um, more or less, with small variations, right? Um, and so the red line that I have plotted uh, is basically starting out using these community fern model um, snow profiles, uh, assuming that there's no melt at all, right, and plugging that into a radiative transfer model um, to get this red line, which is really what the brightness temperature um, theoretically we're assuming would be if there was no melt at all. Um, and then trying to extract something from, from the difference between this red line and the black line. And so what's, what's currently used for um, understanding melt from uh, passive microwave data, which is super useful, is kind of creating this threshold. And the threshold is based on statistics about the austral winter mostly. So you can kind of create this line and above it is a melt day, and below it would be a considered a non-melt day. So people tend to plot, you know, um, number of melt days versus number of non-melt days, right? Um, which is great, but then you don't have information to sort of quantify any number to the amount of liquid water. And so what I do then is I iterate through using my radio transfer model, testing different amounts of liquid water, right? And that sort of creates this dark blue line um, which then you can actually compare it to the liquid water from the community fern model. Um, though this, this is still super preliminary, the community fern model output I'm working with here is five daily, which isn't, isn't enough to consider melt. Um, but using that same sort of idea, we can kind of create these spatial plots of liquid water that are certainly definitely preliminary and you know, still have confusion regarding grain size and all of that. Um, but you can kind of start to see a spatial pattern um, in um, amount of melt. So that's, you know, pretty interesting. And, um, but the one kind of caveat here, right, is definitely vertical stratigraphy of liquid water. So if there is a greater amount of liquid water kind of deeper into the snow, that might give the same signal as a smaller amount of water near to the surface. And so to sort of solve that, you need to use multiple channels, you need to use multiple frequencies that are sensitive to different depths to kind of get at um, this question of a vertical stratigraphy to kind of actually come up with an accurate absolute value, right? Um, and so, of course, still iterating on this surface grain size, trying to trying to nail it down, um, as well as kind of scale up these calculations, improving computational speed, uh, because the rate of transfer model can be a bit um, uh, uh, slow, but um, I think it's it's definitely worth it to try to um, 
push a little bit past the threshold method and kind of start to come up with some, some numbers associated with it, even if they do have uncertainties. I can't see if there's anything in the chat or anything, so. Um, Maybe we just, don't have any questions in the chat just yet, but if okay. anyone does have any for Marissa, then please do go ahead and ask them now. Hey, Marissa, uh, great talk. For grain size, have you thought about uh, looking to some of the ice bridge dual frequency LIDAR data that Ben Smith has been inverting for grain size at all? It gives super high resolution grain size and seems to be working pretty well. Oh, um, I have not heard about that, but that is really awesome, really interesting to, to, to think about. I'll write that down. Ben Smith. Any more questions for Marissa? Yeah, hi, this is Torsten, and maybe that's a dumb question. Uh, I'm just wondering, Marissa, how do you define a uh, melt? I, I mean, in what unit? I guess it's volume percent or do you have any idea what melt right. means? Um, so in the radiative transfer model, it's kind of, it's really defined as liquid water content. So it's a um, just a, like a volume fraction amount of, of melt. So amount of liquid water volume versus a t per unit volume, um, right? And so what I'm kind of doing here is having that be uniform and then integrating over it. Um, but right, that kind of compl is complicated with vertical stratigraphy of, you know, is it really uniform? Um, is it is it greater in a certain layer and lesser in another layer? Um, yeah. Right, but, yeah, completely get that. Right, right. That's that's a trick, right. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Hey, Marissa, um, this is Kaya Riverman. I'm curious, um, what's the temporal resolution of the AMSR2 um, data that you're working with, like what kind of yeah. temporal resolution can we expect from your final data product? Right, so um, the product that I'm working with is level three and it's a daily gridded product. Um, although, so it combines more or less, I believe four or five different measurements um, over the course of a day. So it, it could be um, further broken down, um, but the product I'm working with right now is daily. That's super exciting. Hey Marissa, following up on that, does um, does Amser two also have multiple overpasses during one day, or, or just one? And is is your are you, are your results dependent on the time of overpass you think during the day? Well, that's yeah. So that's one of the good things about using the gridded product is that if you average them all together, I believe it, it doesn't necessarily matter. Although it would matter, right, if there's a certain amount of melt one portion of the day, like there's a lot of melt between 4 and 5 p.m., but then it's totally like, you know, obviously like totally dry the rest of the day and there's no overpass during that time, then you would be biased. Um, but, um, but yeah, so but there are multiple ones that are averaged in for one day. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, thank you so much, Marissa. That was a great talk. Um, thank you. We, if you have any more questions that come to you for Marissa, then please do drop them into the chat or save them for the discussion at the end. But we're going to. We stick with the use case and move on to Brooke now. So I just have to wait for Jan to share my share a screen for me. 
hopefully that's all better for everyone. <laughs> Looks great here. Okay, great. Um, and thank you, Jan, for being my slide presenter. Um, so yeah, so my name is Brooke Medley. I'm at NASA Goddard. And my talk today is on some preliminary um, in progress work towards investigating the magnitude of snow redistribution over Antarctica using um, a whole bunch of different data sets there. And just want to acknowledge uh, my co-authors, Jan Lennertz, Marissa, Eric Keenan, Nander, and Steve Paul. So next slide. Okay, so I love, I mean, I, this is my favorite figure ever, right? So this is why Jan put it in his, um, his uh, review of geophysics paper. Um, this is looking at a transect from the Pine Island Glacier catchment area on the left there. And on the right, we have on the bottom, the ice bridge snow radar, which is really just looking at sort of sub subsurface stratigraphy, um, which is really largely reflecting changes in the net accumulation rate. And so this whole distance is actually just 85 kilometers, but you can see there's extreme variability at more of the, you know, two to five kilometer scale. And if you look on the top panel, we have the ice bridge ATM uh, slope here, you can actually very easily see some sort of relationship between snow accumulation and the actual topography or slope of the, um, of the ice sheet. And so this is sort of where um, kind of the idea here is, can we actually start to look at these different parameters in tandem to maybe try to map out what we see in the snow radar data without actually having to have snow radar data over the entire ice sheet. And so if you click one more time, just to give you some references, you know, um, RACMA2 and MAR are sort of the cutting edge regional climate models that we have, and MARA2 is a global, excuse me, reanalysis model. Those are sort of the length scales that those models resolve. And so what does it really mean when you're redistributing snow at, you know, between 35 kilometer grid cells? So um, the idea here was, can we actually maybe take a more simplistic approach and, and do it statistically? So the next slide, please. So yeah, the idea is can we predict where snow redistribution is occurring and by how much? And so there's been, I mean, this doesn't even scratch the surface of all the work that people have done uh, looking at um, topography and snow accumulation. Uh, Ted Scambos and Indrani Das both had papers on looking at wind scour um, and using this parameter mean slope in the wind direction, which Marissa knows all about, uh, which is the dot product of the slope and wind vectors and trying to relate that uh, back to uh, locations of wind scour, largely in East Antarctica. Um, some new work by both Marissa and Michael Studinger, um, trying to look at this parameter and, and actually look at snow redistribution. Uh, and then there's also just other work even from the modeling community by Augusta et al, which is using MAR, that's finding this relationship between wind speed and surface curvature, although albeit at much larger length scales um, than some of the other studies. So click one more time. Thank you. Um, and so this is really not a question I'm necessarily going to answer, but it sort of uh, sort of poses or promotes the work or motivates the work of like, if it really does just come down to topography and wind, maybe we can actually make sense of, of snow redistribution in a very simplistic way. Um, but then you can also have things of maybe there's a propensity to move such as things like density and and, and crusting and things like that. So anyway, we'll start simple though. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna use two great new data sets. So the first one is from Marissa Datler who just presented. Uh, she did this for her masters with uh, Jan and she looked at snow radar data over much of the Antarctic ice sheet and actually derived um, very fine resolution snow accumulation rates at, I think it's posted at 100 meter along track spacing. So you can uh, basically get that really fine scale spatial variability that you can't really get um, with just uh, field measurements alone. But then we also have ISAT2, um, which also is giving us some phenomenal um, topography estimates. So if you click one more time. So the idea here is, can we get these sort of broad scale surface mass balance anomalies from a large scale model? So take Marissa's model and subtract out uh, MERA2 and get this um, surface mass balance anomaly. Uh, and then can we predict that? And so if you click one more time, 
uh, we can get our driver topographic variables from I set two. And if we click once more, we can get um, wind speeds and directions from Mara two. So that's sort of the idea. Uh, if you click one more time, here is our I set two DM that we have derived. So um, the idea here was really to just maximize spatial coverage. And so what we did was actually use the first three cycles of ISET 2 from October 2018 till June 2019, when we actually can take advantage of the fact that ISET 2 wasn't pointing always to the same place and to its reference ground track, which actually means we don't get repeat tracks, which is unfortunate from a height change perspective, but it means we get better spatial coverage. Um, and so I pretty much took ATL 6 right out of the box, a little bit of filtering, um, and we can build this beautiful DM. I mean, the product is super amazing. Um, and we built it at different resolutions there. Um, what I'm showing is a very poorly masked um, grounded ice sheet uh, that we had to actually fill in at the edges with uh, Rima elevation because ISAT 2 doesn't fully, uh, is not fully capable of, uh, you know, mapping elevations at a one kilometer resolution. But it, it's again, only 7% had to be filled. So the next slide shows the same thing. So what we showed before was just the, the surface elevation, but that doesn't really tell us sort of what we're more interested in, which is actually what is snow redistributing around. And so if you take just a 50 kilometer high pass filter through the DEM, this is what you see. And now all of a sudden you can see all of this wonderful detail of, of you know, this um, sub grid scale basically topography that snow will redistribute around. And so next slide. Um, the SMB and wind are also both gridded to the same um, grid as the DEM. I do not downscale wind speeds, so that's definitely um, could end up being a big problem. And one modification we made was rather than just do the mean slope in the mean wind direction, we actually weight it by the concurrent snowfall rate. And the idea here being storm tracks, which actually produce the um, snowfall, you know, likely have different wind orientations than, um, you know, just when there's clear skies and everything. So, and it actually did make a, res or a big difference between just doing the non-weighted um, snowfall. Um, and I think the next slide might be my last slide. So this, as I said, is, a t is completely a work in progress. I wish I had some super cool map um, to show you all, but I don't yet. Uh, but I think it's possible, and this is nothing shocking, um, that it's not simple. I mean, I feel like that's kind of the story of, of all of our lives, right? If there's never this simple relationship, but I am seeing a lot of promise. And so I think with some more exploration into the data, um, trying to explore potentially other predictors, like for instance, what I'm showing here is courtesy of Steve Palm. It's actually looking at blowing snow frequency. So where would you expect there to be wind redistribution? Well, where there's observations of blowing snow. So there's there's lots of other things that could factor into it. I really want to keep it simple though. And so I'm trying to, you know, make sure that there's not this over um, sort of right overfit everything and I end up with some really wonky uh, results. So throwing in the buzzword machine learning, I think that there's a lot of potential there. Uh, I could end up in a slippery slope, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who would do a much better job at it than me. So I really would love any feedback, uh, contributions. If you want to join us, if you say, Brooke, I could do it better than you, you probably can. And so just email me and let me know, and we can we can do it. So I think, oh, there might be one more side, but it's thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Brooke for that. Um, so Brooke has asked for feedback, so hopefully we have plenty of questions now. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you have one. So nobody can do it better than me. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, well, I have one to fill the gap while people are collecting their thoughts. I'm sure we will have some more questions. Um, but see, this 
work has been focused on the grounded ice in Antarctica, what would it take to be able to potentially extend it over onto ice shelves? It, that's a fair question. And in, in, in all honesty, I'm not even quite sure why I made that restriction. And so there's, there's not really necessarily a reason why I couldn't do it there either. It was just, I don't know, I guess I'm just a grounded ice sheet person. So maybe I have to extend my, my horizon off to ice shelves. So that's yeah. a totally fair point. <laughs> I'm sure us ice shelf people would appreciate that. Hi Brooke, this is TJ here. Um, this, this, this is just a question that piqued my curiosity, but would you see, think that you'd see anything different if you applied your, um, your kind of experiment onto Greenland as opposed to Antarctica? Um, I don't see why you couldn't. I, um, you know, it's, it's sort of the same process, um, but I'm much less of a Greenland expert and, and I'm sure other people might have thoughts about that. Um, yeah, so I, as far as I can see from a purely sort of snowfall perspective that I, I think you could potentially do the same thing. I said too might not have as good of coverage though. Okay, well, if we have any more questions for Brit, then please do drop them into the chat. We'll save them for the discussion afterwards. Um, but we're going to move to our final speaker before we go into our discussion, which is Michelle McLennan. All right, um, let me share my screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks good, yeah. Great, thank you. All right, um, thanks everyone for still listening and tuning in, even though this is the last talk in the session. Um, my name is Michelle McLennan and I am a PhD student at the University of Colorado working with Jan Lennertz. And today I'm gonna be presenting on atmospheric rivers over Thwaites Glacier. And I'm gonna start by talking about the climatology of snowfall on Thwaites. So snowfall on Thwaites is highly seasonal. Uh, there's much less snow in the austral summer than there is in the fall, winter, and spring seasons. And this is because snowfall um, is primarily driven by the Amundsen Sea Low, which is a low pressure system that migrates zonally along the Amundsen Sea coastline. And in the fall, winter, and spring seasons, the Amundsen Sea Low tends to be positioned west of the embayment and Thwaites Glacier, meaning that the eastern edge is helping to drive warm and moist ocean air masses onto Thwaites, leading to precipitation. Now, as of this year, uh, we have a brand new set of observations from eastern Thwaites ice shelf for the first time. And these observations come from two automatic weather stations that were on installed on this ice shelf in January 2020 as part of the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration. And these observations provide us with snow height, temperature, wind speed and direction, pressure and humidity, and are very unique because this is the first time that we've had weather stations installed on the lower part of Thwaites at all. And so they can give us um, much more information about the surface mass balance um, and processes that are occurring with atmospheric circulation than we had before. So the first thing that I did with these observations is plot the snow height over time, starting from the installation date on January 16th of this year. Uh, now the observations are in purple and blue here from the two Amigo sites uh, where the automatic weather stations are. And we can see that they're distinct accumulation events occurring and also some compaction over the time period from January through April of this year. We can also plot this with ERA-5 reanalysis of accumulation, noting that the nearest ERA-5 grid point to our observation stations is really close by. And we find that ERA-5 seems to be tracking similar accumulation events during this time. Now the event that drew my attention is occurring in early February of this year, where we see relatively high accumulation over a short amount of time. And we see this event both in our observations and in the ERA-5 reanalysis. 
And so the question is, what's driving this event and what if impacts is it having on Thwaites Glacier? So the answer to this question is that it's an atmospheric river. And in order to dig into this, I'm first going to give a little bit of background on atmospheric rivers over Antarctica in general. So atmospheric rivers are narrow bands of warm and moist air that travel south from the mid-latitudes. And while most of them reside over the Southern Ocean, some of them also make landfall over the Antarctic ice sheet. Now, atmospheric rivers are typically identified through atmospheric moisture content, specifically through vertically integrated water vapor, which is plotted here in orange, or meridional vapor transport, which is plotted here in pink. Both can be indicative of an atmospheric river, and they help to tell us where and when atmospheric rivers are making landfall over Antarctica. Now, these are a in a catalog uh, produced based on Maratu reanalysis by John Jonathan Willey at the University of Grenoble Alps. And these help to tell us more about atmospheric rivers in a way that's easy to identify them. We can make a heat map of the atmospheric rivers that are making landfall, only the ones that are also making landfall over the Antarctic ice sheet. And we see that there are distinct coastal locations where atmospheric rivers tend to reach Antarctica more often than others, particularly along the Antarctic Peninsula, also over the Amundsen Sea sector, and then several locations in East Antarctica. But landfall does tend to be pretty infrequent, occurring only about 1% of the time at any given location and about 14% of the total time on Antarctica. But when atmospheric rivers do make landfall, they can cause heavy precipitation. And from 1980 to 2017, atmospheric rivers contributed to some of the highest precipitation rates over the Antarctic ice sheet. They can also bring high temperatures and cause surface melt, particularly in the coastal regions, and they're associated with changes in wind speed and direction. And any, any atmospheric river events can bring any of those features. So overall, they contribute about 7% of the total precipitation over the Antarctic ice sheet each year. So now we can go back to this atmospheric river event over Thwaites in February 2020. And I'm going to start by playing a video of our atmospheric river catalog during this time so you can see how the atmospheric river is making landfall and where it is. So we, the atmospheric river starts over the southern ocean and travels onto Thwaites and extends zonally across West Antarctica, eventually reaching the Antarctic Peninsula. A few minutes later, or time steps later, the atmospheric river returns and again has a large zonal extent and eventually spreads over the Antarctic Peninsula before it disappears. Now, if I play this again, I just want to emphasize two features here. First of all, the time period that we're looking at is a period of five days, from February 3rd to February 8th. So this is an atmospheric river event that has a very long duration. Also, there's a large area extent that the atmospheric river travels over. So based on these two features, we can expect that the atmospheric river has an impact on precipitation and other features of surface mass balance during this time. So now we can go back to our observations over Thwaites from this year. And I have the observations of snowfall on the top right here or snow height. And we can also look at temperature during this time. So the atmospheric river is shaded in gray here when it's made landfall over Thwaites Glacier. And what we see during this time is that leading up to the atmospheric, land, atmospheric river landfall, we have increases in temperature. And once the atmospheric river is over Thwaites, the temperature uh, reaches freezing and even extends above freezing several times during this period. Also, it remains above freezing for long periods of time. And again, this event takes several days to pass. We also see in our other observations, a change in the wind direction shortly before the atmospheric river makes landfall and again afterwards. And we also see an increase in the average wind speeds during this event. So we also have compared these with ERA-5 and MERA-2 reanalysis. And we find that these are consistent with our observations, leading us to believe 
that we can map out these conditions and again quantify the impact of this event over Thwaites using our reanalysis as well. So the question then is how does this event impact accumulation in February 2020 and how does this compare to the climatology of snowfall events uh, over the year? And again, here is a figure of our snowfall climatology. And this time, I'm not looking at any, uh, I'm not looking at all of Thwaites. This is particularly at the location of our sites of observation. And here in red, we have the monthly accumulation totals for this year. And while January, March, and April are all fairly close to the mean accumulation from our um, multi-decade average, the February accumulation is extraordinarily high this year at 128 millimeters of water equivalent. And furthermore, if we just take the accumulation from our atmospheric river event alone from February 3rd through 8th, we found that this event alone accounts for 67 millimeters of water equivalent, which is about half of our total accumulation in February. So clearly this one event is having a significant impact on the surface mass balance of Thwaites Ice Shelf and likely Thwaites Glacier as well. Now, this is early research, um, and so the plans for the future are to continue looking at this event over Thwaites. The idea is to extract snowfall rates and surface melt from our observations in Mara 2 to quantify how much can be associated to this particular event using a FERN model. And then we also want to look more broadly at atmospheric river events that are making landfall over West Antarctica. Atmospheric river events tend to have certain flavors or characteristics based on temperature, wind speed and direction, precipitation types, and precipitation amounts. And all of those can tell us about their impact on surface mass balance. And it's likely that West Antarctica has certain characterizations that might be different from other areas in Antarctica. So we're looking into this. And then finally, I'm interested in linking this atmospheric river event and atmospheric river events that are impacting Thwaites more closely to the Amundsen Sea Low and to modes of atmospheric variability uh, in the Southern Ocean as well. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. That was really interesting. And um, we've got time for a couple of questions for Michelle before we go into the general discussion. So if anyone has one, then please go ahead and unmute yourself. I'll go ahead and ask one if I can. This is Peter. Um, I wrote it in the chat as well, but um, Michelle, that talk was great. I was wondering uh, if you could comment on, on how you might be able to use weather station data from, from inland stations to compare how far atmospheric rivers penetrate uh, inland versus the coast and, and how their impacts might differ. I think that's a fantastic idea, and I'm super interested in using weather station data inland to track the atmospheric rivers. Um, one problem when it comes to tracking atmospheric rivers in the algorithm that we're using is that the air becomes so cold and dry as you move inland that it gets harder and harder to track them. And so using observations can also help to supplement that process. Also, there could be a large difference in the impact that atmospheric rivers have depending on how far inland they go. For example, they can bring high temperatures to coastal areas leading to surface melt, but if they move further inland, they might have a greater impact on snow accumulation as well. So I think that's a really interesting aspect to look at. I'm super interested in doing that, and it's a great point you brought up. Yeah, it'd be awesome to talk more because they probably penetrate all the way to the South Pole. So and you have yeah. data all along yeah. the transect there. That would be great. And our algorithm currently stops at 80 south. So I think it would be particularly useful to look at observations south of that area. Okay, so we've had a few comments in the chat as well. Um, not questions. Kaya is apparently claiming that it's hard work to be a field scientist somehow. 
I don't know. Um, and yeah, Brooke has pointed out that there are some parallels with C. Shields' I actually work, so that's really cool that we're seeing some stuff from the other sessions come through as well. Um, do we have any more questions for Michelle before we move on to our discussion? Okay, well, of course, there is still time to ask them to Michelle during the discussion, should they come to you. Um, so maybe I'm just going to start out if do we have any more questions for our speakers that people have thought of since the talks that they would like to get answered now. I'm just going to open the floor to general questions or, of course, any particular themes. Now you've seen that variety of talks have had some modelling and some observations. That was really cool um, that you would particularly like us to discuss. Well, Sammy, maybe I can ask a question of you that I had too, because um, your talk reminded me of um, Mickey Mackey's talk yesterday, um, where she was looking at, you know, the impact of uncertainty in bed topography on water, water routing beneath the ice sheet. And I wondered if you had thought about the parallels between her work and how your uncertainty in your surface DM, you know, ultimately translates into uncertainties in the water routing. but maybe doing some sort of statistical approach of routing the water because it's an imperfect, you know, surface. I, mean, I don't know if you saw our talk, so. No, I did, yeah, and that's that's a great point because I think the uncertainties in the DEM I'm using are really one, gonna be one of the key sources of uncertainty for the model because it makes so much difference for, for where the water is gonna end up. And there's some stuff that, will change is kind of water can erode the way through the fern or heights will change as stuff melts but because that's what i'm starting with and like slopes on ice shelves aren't exactly small that that is definitely very important so that's something that is worth thinking about in the future for sure yeah you will need to extend your dm to ice shelves bro there is no way around it <laughs> <laughs> so i think we've peer pressured her enough into doing that so I'm sure we'll get that type waste next year. We'll have a great product. Yeah, what, what I what I got personally from all the talks, and this is more of a comment, maybe, or, or a, you know, and, and a start of a discussion, is that a lot of the problems that we're facing are three dimensional. So we a lot of our models currently are are. Um, really focused on the, on the, you know, one dimensional simplicity of things of the fern or the atmosphere or um, the, the ice. And, you know, both from like Sammy's talk and Brooke's talk and Michelle's talk, obviously, um, as atmospheric rivers and, and Marissa's talk, all of those were examples and Riley's talk, <laughs> all, all of those were examples of, of, you know, high, spatial variations in on, on very small distances um, which I think calls for you know unfortunately the fact that we we cannot go away with with one-dimensional modeling or, or observations for that matter and really need to account for all these small-scale variations uh, that are so important to understand the system I think that's that's really key in the next you know in the years to come I think I'd be curious to hear from the speakers. Um, you know, I think we really heard um, the extent to which these 3D models uh, of fern structure are going to be so important moving forward and, and how melt plays into that. And what are the missing physics at this point in terms of like from your perspective, what are the key processes in that that we're missing right now, whether it's, I don't know, melt water fingering down in or like as observationalists, what physics do we need to still develop so that these models can do a better job. Well, I'm happy to comment on everything I would possibly want in a 3D fern model. Um, and 
so at least for the stuff that I'm looking at, which often has to do with like refreezing features in the subsurface, I think, yeah, that like preferential percolation issue and sort of like what it is in the like microstructure and the density that is actually producing sort of like horizontal ice lensing and why you get large horizontal extent in some places and much more heterogeneous refreezing in others. Like those are all things that I think we don't, certainly don't resolve in the 1D models. I'm not sure we've even entirely sort of experimentally or otherwise resolved the exact like physics of and would be super great to see as we're, you know, trying to get at that sort of big question of like, where does the surface melt water actually go and how's it changing the whole structure? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that because where does the surface melt go is a question I'm really trying to answer with my model and having observations to actually back up what I'm trying to model is always great. Um, we have a lot of really good stuff coming through about surface melt, but what's going on subsurface, um, even just like not even really deep subsurface, but what's happening in the top few meters of the fan would be really, really useful information. Yeah, and I guess I would add in lots of places, because I think right now where we have that, it's like, all right, one awesome snow pit, like one place in Greenland, we saw this thing happen. Um, but it's like, it's definitely hard to sort of generalize that to sort of continental scale behaviors or sort of like the, the general mechanisms when the observations are sort of at the scale of like one place over like one month kind of things. Yeah, more snow pits. I'm very, very that. <laughs> the person who generally sits safely at home and drinks a cup of tea in my office. Or you go out and drink, um, dig, dig snow pits for me, please. Um, I've just seen that we have a question from Emily for Michelle. So Emily, do you want to go ahead and ask that one so that we don't miss it? Sure. Yeah, I was wondering from a modeling perspective, uh, where if we have these relatively short-lived events that still influence our surface mass balance, uh, how do we prescribe precipitation in models or like how frequently should we change that prescription? Um, kind of reworded it, but I think it's still the same question. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. I saw your comment and I was actually just in the process of responding um, via text, um, but I'm also getting the message that my internet is unstable. So please let me know if I cut out. Um, so I, for atmospheric rivers, I look at snowfall on an hourly time scale, uh, which is really um, necessary for these types of events. And I'm still looking at how long they last, but for the most part, it's only a few hours to a few days. And the event that I showed today was really even an exception with that. So, um, high, so I previously looked at high snowfall events over uh, Thwaites and these high snowfall events were like the top 10% of daily snowfall from 1980 to 2017. And these events contribute to more than 50% of the total snowfall that we see. And that's also on daily time scales. So I would say they have to be short. These events come and, um, you know, really specific events bring a lot of precipitation. Uh, so um, yeah, my answer is pretty short time scales. Well, that sounds pretty challenging because currently I think coupling is like, you know, every one or two weeks if you're doing really well. So that's uh, intimidating, but good to know. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we've had a few comments in the chat about um, thinking about spatial resolution and also temporal resolution in Antarctica. Um, so I wondered if anyone, either modelers or observationists, had any feelings about which one we should be focusing on improving most at the moment for surface mass balance and fern in particular. Um, obviously, we'd love to do both, but we don't have the field time or the computing time to be able to do both necessarily. So what do we feel is the most important for really capturing these processes in Antarctica? If no one has anything, I, I'm happy to chime in that I think it's observations that one of the most challenging things that to measure is basically how do these processes vary in time? I mean, it's it, we can often get snapshots, um, you know, from satellite imagery, or from field measurements, but to actually see an evolution of, say, a meltwater on 
pond on an ice shelf is like super difficult. So personally, as someone who kind of spans both modeling and, and uh, observations, I think the observations, especially for these processes, need to have a much better temporal component to it. But it's not an easy task. <laughs> I, I can add in that it's really feels very special to be able to work with observations on Slate's ice shelf now, but that also we've seen a lot of similarities between these observations and MERA2 and ERA5 reanalysis, which is also reassuring because if we're looking at quantifying total snowfall on Slate's or surface mass balance, then we are still relying very heavily on models and reanalysis products. So that was kind of an interesting feature that came out from the recent research I've been doing with these observations and was also encouraging for research when we don't have access to them. We're not using MERA2, Brooke, we're using ERA5 these days. <laughs> so I'll pick on Sushio because I keep trying to get him to say something and he's not, but um, he's been looking at, um, I said, two elevation changes and relationship to atmospheric rivers over West Antarctica. And he seems to like Mira too. It looks a lot like the altimetry, just saying. <laughs> It's really interesting to hear, uh, Sushil. I, I would love to 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 see uh, what you've been doing and what you're working on. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, yeah, it's <clears throat> so we compared kind of I said to elevation changes over mostly West Antarctica with different reanalysis and uh, Mera two does really well even compared to ERA five and uh, we've also found that Brooke. Fern model kind of beats all of those reanalysis data on their own. So like, that's just, it's the way it should work, but it's just nice to see that uh, the Fern model is actually doing what we think it should do. And yeah, I'll send you what we have so far on uh, ICET2 data. Jan, thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. So I, I have a question on the, the observations we have. So I think one of the, as, as, as Sammy mentioned, one of the issues we have with, um, from a modeling perspective in, in, the, in the meltwater world, let's say the ice shelf world is um, how pervasive these ice layers are that uh, develop under the surface. So we cannot see them from the, from, from from the air, cannot see them visibly, but we can probably detect them through a satellite. So I think it would be super useful to know how pervasive, how, how extensive these ice layers are, if they are extensive at all, or if they are broken up, because if they're broken up, that means that there are areas uh, on ice shells where the meltwater can actually penetrate. If there are not, that means that this, this is like a continuous um, layer that is basically uh, preventing all meltwater to to uh, to escape from from surface or near the surface. Um, what 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 do people think is available to to you know to do these sort of things? I mean, the Riley's talk was kind of getting there. Uh, is that is that the 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 are these the options we have? Are there other data sets we need to explore or can explore? Maybe that's a question for you, Riley, uh, or, or other people, of course, feel free to chime in. Yeah, I mean, I'm a one track observationalist, I guess. So I'm always going to tell you that radar will solve your problem. Um, in, in this case, it somewhat can, I think. So I have not looked at this on ice shells, but we actually just finished up a pretty extensive project in Greenland. Um, 
looking at refrozen subsurface ice layers from the 2012 melt event um, that we track quite well with the accumulation radar there. Um, a, you know, whatever essentially the sampling of that radar is, so sort of like 15 to 20 meters after processing. Um, so it's still a little bit tough to sort of say like, okay, on the like one to two meter scale, are there gaps in this thing or not? Um, that's, you know, that, that's, that's still iffy because there's a lot of sort of variations in the radar power that we'll see that might be because you're missing ice and might be because of other things. Um, but you can certainly get a pretty good sort of like spatial map of where it is and isn't in some sense of sort of like the continuity of those features with these sort of um, better range resolution systems. Um, so I think at least, yeah, from my perspective, that's probably at least a step up from doing fern cores because um, you get some sense of what the horizontal spatial extent is and, and how continuous those things are. I was gonna say from, from the Antarctic perspective, perspective with this ice bridge snow radar, um, Brooke, I don't know if you looked before either that, um, you know, as you're going across ice rises versus domes, you see the snow stratigraphy um, it's essentially a loss of signal when you get down to the low elevation ice shelves, which is presumably from more meltwater presence. And I, I don't know if, if you could explore how pervasive that is. I know there are parts of, um, you know, say moving inland on the Getz ice shelf where you do have good layering in the snow radar on an ice shelf. But if you move out towards the coast where it's warmer or, or you know, some orographic impact is happening there, you lose that signal. So that presumably there's more, more surface melt. Yeah, I'll definitely say that someday I will get to a project that looks at that transition mechanism from sort of percolation to no percolation um, in the radar. And yeah, there are definitely, I think, interesting signatures there that do sort of map also to the continuity of ice layers and whatnot. Um, because, you know, if you've got something sort of very continuous in the subsurface, that tends to be a fairly clear and continuous reflector in the radar. Whereas in a lot of these percolation zones, you get just sort of this like mishmash of power back. So like you're, you're losing penetration and you're getting a lot of scattering, which would sort of indicate that at least on like the wavelength scale of these radars, you've got something sort of more heterogeneous refreezing or like stuff in the ice that is kind of like also on that wavelength scale. Um, so I think there are totally interesting signatures to look at there and probably something that we can say about that, but it's definitely like in the future project and characterization still. Hi, this is Torsten again. I have a question maybe for Peter or uh, anyone else. When you say you need better time information or temporal resolution, what scales are you thinking of? Or what temporal resolution? Um, I mean, so I can answer from my, my perspective, which is gonna be the, the ice core guy. So, so I'm thinking of back in time, um, which, which can't really help with, um, you know, thinking about resolution of, of observations moving forward in time, of course, but, um, you know, we can add to essentially wherever you have a weather station uh, now and, and you're collecting data moving forward in time, we could go to the same location and, and build uh, on that record going back in time with, with the ice core record. And of course, out on the coast um, where all these processes are that we're thinking about, we have great resolution because it, it snows a lot. Um, just to get a selfish plug in on time scales for processes that that matter um, for places like Thwaites and Pine Island um, being so affected by ocean processes, you know, we want to get records going back a couple hundred years because Pacific Ocean variability, El Nino, La Nina really matter as we've seen in, in um, you know, observations that fall or that are that are presented at waste all the time, things like Sushil and, and what um, Helen's group are doing, seeing how the ice shelves respond to that, um, that longer you know, interannual and, and multi-decadal scale variability in the Pacific Ocean. So that's that's my sort of temporal um, need I think we have in the communities. We really need to see how those longer scale processes are affecting all of these things that, that we are, are trying to model and observe. So to come into that on a more shorter time scale side of things, I'd say in terms of modeling surface melt, we really need stuff that is a better temporal resolution than daily because it seems like definitely 
what Michelle's been talking about, atmospheric events can obviously have a huge impact on conditions on Antarctica. And also when I was looking at last and sea, for example, fern winds are really important. So this is things that can change from day to day or even hour to hour. And they can cause huge amounts of melt. So really having observations to be able to narrow down the effect that those processes are having on the ice shelf would be really useful. Yeah, I agree with the sub-daily um, idea because melt is typically marginal on Antarctica and it's, it doesn't occur during the entire day. Typically occurs around noon when the sun is strongest and then it uh, refreezes again in the, in the late afternoon or evening. So it's a very delicate process, but it changes the characteristics of the surface entirely. So we need to know when it melts and I would say uh, when it stops melting and what it does to the surface all at the same time at let's say hourly time scale. So I think there is the, 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 the point that Peter alludes to which is kind of uh, extending time and then there is the, the, the other spectrum, the other side of the spectrum which is the resolution which is kind of like knowing what's happening with, within hours time. We know that when snow falls, the, the snow characteristics, snow density changes from hour to hour. Um, and that, that determines obviously things like surface height change and all these things um, associated to it. So I would argue that that, that, that is super important to capture in, in observations as well. So maybe I'll play like, I don't know, devil's advocate or something where, so, so ice up to right has a 91 day repeat cycle. So you can't really get fantastic temporal resolution, but you can get pretty decent spatial resolution. Would you, if you could only, ba if you had to balance these two, would you want something more like a weekly, but at coarser spatial resolution, or would you want something that's the same thing and just take the 91 days? Because 91 days is basically the whole melt season, right? So, or not even, I mean, to more than. So just curious if people have any uh, interesting thoughts as to would, for surface processes, because that's kind of what we're talking about, would we actually prefer to have less spatial resolution, but enhanced temporal resolution? We can stop recording too, if people were nervous about saying. <laughs> I think that you know, that this is a good highlights the great sort of the fundamental Antarctic problem that we have, where we're always limited in space or time or both, and and maybe that brings up that that our interpolation methods between the two of those, uh, you know, filling those gaps is is also something we need to think carefully about too. How to best fill that empty space using um, the analyses and, and other more model based data sets. I think as well, just adding on top that with different sorts of instrumentation, we can start thinking about doing more targeted observations as well. So Bellevue sort of does it over some regions, very good spatial resolution for temporal resolution. I mean, I, you can easily think of an instrument that does the opposite in key regions, uh, maybe, maybe in regions with high uh, extreme precipitation, right? maybe near coastal regions and things like that. Yeah, we were discussing. So, um, and that's exactly what I was thinking, Sushil, um, is, you know, like spontaneously, I thought about tethered balloons. Would tethered balloons be something useful? I don't even know whether that would work in Antarctica. I have no idea. But, you know, if you have a balloon hanging there and you have some hyperspectral imager somewhere high up over a critical area, so that you have super high, uh, uh, temporal resolution and regional, well, local scale spatial resolution. Would something like this be of use? I'm just throwing something out here. I'm all for it, Thorsten, myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds great. You can do that work in Antarctica. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The logistical side is something else, but I mean, having targeted regions with high temporal resolution in combination with 
something like you know things like I said too, which provide the spatial resolution is I think the 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 best we can do or or maybe should do. Right, right. Yeah, I don't know whether it's possible, but it's something to look into maybe. Or drones, right? All the time. Love drones. Okay, well, I have to say I didn't imagine balloons is probably where we were going to be finishing our session today, but I guess that's one of the great things about we you never know quite what's coming. Um, we have got a couple of minutes left if anyone has any final questions or comments, but I think it's probably good if we try not to run over, given that some of you, especially on the West Coast, had a very early start if you're at the session this morning. Um, so do we have any final points people were keen to make before we finish up? I'm just going to remind you as well, Brooke put the link in the chat to register for the plenary sessions next week. Um, I'm going to put that link in again so it doesn't, it's right at the bottom for you all. So that's for the sessions on Wednesday, no, Tuesday and Wednesday next week to register for those. They're both super important topics. So we'd love to see lots of you there. Um, unless we have anything else anyone wants to come in with then thank you so much to all of our speakers you all kept wonderfully for time even though Jan and I went a bit rogue lots of you still gave eight minute talks anyway so that was pretty awesome and um, so hopefully we're not in too much trouble with the waste organizing committee no way we will, we, we will be banned next year <laughs> <laughs> that's already that's like, I just want to be next year to find someone else that's okay with me <laughs> And I also want to just say there's also a survey for people to fill out as well. It was in Matt's um, email from last week about um, COVID-19 related impacts. So do fill that out as well. We want to hear from, from everybody. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoy your evening, afternoon, whatever it is. Go and have a carbonated beverage as I think we said at Waste last year. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.